Hi, this is Phoenix, and I'm going to talk about what it means to live a meaningful life. Um, this talk, as you, as you can tell, is called On the Meaningful Life. Um, I'm going to approach it from the perspective of philosophy. So I'm not going to say specifically that I know what a meaningful life is. I imagine that to some degree a meaningful life is going to be relativistic. It's going to depend on the person. It's going to be very individualistic, and it's going to depend on uh, what each person finds to be meaningful. Nonetheless, I'm going to approach it uh, from a philosophical perspective. There might be, because I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere, there might be a lot of random noises that'll just spontaneously, uh, that you'll spontaneously hear, that might be distracting. And if that happens, what we'll try to do is we'll try to find the meaning in that. Um, and if that doesn't happen, then we'll find the meaning in the absence and the silence of that. But we'll see. Um, it's more of just an experiment out of curiosity, but we'll see. Anyway, I want to start off with talking about three figures who thought about a meaningful life. That was Socrates, Buddha, and Nietzsche. Um, so Socrates believed that, so he seemed to find the most meaning in life and found a life to be meaningful by trying to live a virtuous life. And I think we can all kind of imagine what that means. It's, it's pretty simplistic. Uh, but it's, it's hard to live, and I think that that was kind of the challenge with, uh, essentially with Socrates and his philosophy. He basically lived his virtuous life to the end of his life, where he was essentially executed for his beliefs and his convictions. As you'll well know if you know the story of Socrates, when he took the hemlock. There's also the way that he found meaning was through his Socratic ignorance which is essentially where he questioned everything. So Socrates is interesting because he seemed to have this implication that there was no such thing as certain knowledge. So the term for a system of knowledge that guarantees truth is called, found, is called a foundationalist system of knowledge. But Socrates right at the beginning was challenging any kind of foundationalist notion of truth. And I think that that's interesting. So the, the idea behind Socratic ignorance is that you are knowledgeable of your own ignorance and you're knowledgeable of the things you don't know and you use that to essentially uncover the ignorance of other people to ironically try to come to some kind of idea of truth and so all of this has different has interesting implications for epistemology and our study of knowledge socrates pretty much saying that you ironically find meaning by not finding truth um, and essentially devoting your life to trying to find that truth nonetheless, even though it's very difficult to find and even impossible to find. So just someone to keep in mind, there's also Buddha who, um, he didn't find a lot of meaning for a long time until he developed his theory of his uh, ideas of Buddhism. But essentially, he thirsted for understanding and he thirsted for knowledge. And his uh, quest was to understand what reality is and what and why we're here. And so it's interesting because he challenged the two dominant philosophies and lifestyles of his time in India. He challenged Jainism and the Jains, which believed in extreme asceticism and extreme nonviolence. So uh, the Jains would essentially starve themselves when they finally felt that they had reached their ultimate potential and they would starve themselves because they didn't want to hurt anything and because they saw themselves as just causing pain by simply existing. And the Hindus had this very metaphysical and religious way of going about things and Buddha was dissatisfied with both of them. And so he didn't find meaning in either of them. So kind of keep that in the background for now in terms of thinking about how hard it is for some people to find meaning. Essentially you could call Buddha a classical romantic you know, because he was disenchanted with society and with philosophies and he, he sought to find his own. Then of course, of course there's Nietzsche and Nietzsche's main idea is, one of his main ideas is the idea of self-creation. So we look at our lives as something that we must be an active participant in, not just a spectator. And we must create ourselves and our lives as if we're creating a piece of art. And this whole idea of self-creation is pretty powerful because that's essentially where we can find meaning. And it's very hard to put into practice, but 
yeah, essentially that's what he, he tried to do. And so I'm bringing up these, these three figures to show the diversity and even the um, impossibility of trying to find meaning. But how nonetheless they felt that it was something that could be possible in their own way and so they, they sought for it. Uh, they sought it out. So, real fast I'm going to go through a couple of philosophies um, to kind of show the contradictions with, the mean, with some kind of meaning of life. So there's Lame Deer who was an American Indian who felt that the best way that you can find a meaning of life is by essentially getting in touch with nature. Any, any perception of science would essentially see it in the opposite light because they would say that they would imply that technology is what drives society and technology is progress, not nature. So even though science might be an understanding of nature, it's also a manipulation of nature and it's not natural nature, so to speak. Um, and then there's also the contradiction between Confucianism and Taoism. So Taoism favored this kind of spontaneity where you wouldn't overthink your actions, you would just do them, while Confucianism saw order through every action. And so there's that contradiction. And then there's Kant's idea and the idea found in the Book of Job. So the Book of Job implies that the universe is incomprehensible. Kant, however, would say that, Immanuel Kant, would say that the universe can be understood through, through, um, through reason and rationality. And so essentially all of these viewpoints are opposing. So what is this, so what does the three people that I mentioned have to do with these contradicting philosophies? Well, as you can see, there's first off different individual ways of finding truth and meaning in life, but there's also contradicting lifestyles. And the trick is how do we adapt certain lifestyles? And this is why I wanna, so I brought them up because I think that they definitely illustrate um, the point that I'm trying to get at, which is that there's different lifestyles that we can adopt. So it's really hard to be, you know, 100% spontaneous and 100% uh, fully ordered uh, in terms of your actions. It's really hard to see the world as comprehensible and incomprehensible at the same time. I suppose it could exist, but it's very, very difficult. Um, and so it's definitely a problem of contradiction because, but, but that's okay because I have this idea which is essentially we live deterministic lifestyles or essentially the idea that our lifestyles are determined. So if you're a skater, your life is determined by the subculture of skaters. If you are a homeless person, a homeless kid, your life is uh, dictated by essentially, um, essentially, uh, you know, the subculture of homelessness. Uh, you can take any kind of lifestyle, the college student, the, the jock, you know, there's, and so, but my idea is that we, we shouldn't always shun these kind of lifestyles that we're kind of channeled into. So there's a lot of external pressures that act on us to force us to live a certain lifestyle. But sometimes I don't think that that's necessarily bad. So determinism often has a bad rap. But in this case, I don't think it's necessarily bad because I think these lifestyles can lead to a beautiful plurality of essentially um, possibility and existence. And so it's nothing to fear. So the lifestyle that I see myself as being channeled toward and into is the idea, is the lifestyle of a conservative bohemian. And so a bohemian is essentially a writer that lives an unconventional life. So they would often be into parties, they would, um, you know, they would drink, they would do drugs, they would have a lot of sex. Um, they would do a lot of really, you know, a lot of really unconventional stuff. But they would do, so like I think of like Jack Kerouac and Rimbaud, Baudelaire, um, Allen Ginsberg, all of these, all of these writers that lived very unconventional lives. Edgar Allan Poe even. And they lived very unconventional lives. And, but the reason why I consider myself conservative is because um, my life is conservative in the sense that I don't do any of those crazy kinds of things, and yet mentally I do entertain a lot of crazy ideas. So mentally I still have a lot of those crazy impulses um, and thoughts that I channel into my writing. And so that's why I consider myself a, still a bohemian, because I have that kind of edge and I have that, that craziness, but I'm conservative in the sense that I don't like you know, go out, you know, go completely crazy with it. Now, of course, there's an alternative to this viewpoint, you know, so if, let's say that you're being pressured to be a football player and to adopt that kind of culture by your parents, but you don't want to live that. Well, of course, you can actively fight against it, and there is that possibility, 
And I think that if that gives your life meaning, then I think that it's certainly something that you should take into account. I certainly think that it's something that you should not avoid if you don't want to be a football player, if you'd rather be a soccer player or a gymnast or uh, some other kind of person. You know, maybe a writer, a conservative bohemian, you know, anything. Whatever you want to do, you can actively resist that lifestyle. Um, and I think the choice is yours to decide if you want to try to contribute to the pluralism that the universe kind of seems to have preset for us. Um, and because that's a very metaphysical way of looking at things, we could also essentially push against that. So I don't have to be a conservative bohemian. I could just be a crazy bohemian or I could not even be a writer. I could not even be a bohemian. The choice is essentially mine. So just keep those two viewpoints in mind. So I want to say real fast, because I'm running out of time, that I don't think that I can find very much meaning in modern day society in our secularized, um, well not, not necessarily because it's secularized, but because it's just so very, it's just so very anti-metaphysical, I guess. And I think that those things prevent us. And I think especially our postmodern consumerism, I think that um, that makes things difficult as well. And um, so I've been, I've been blowing off bugs from my hands. They're attracting to me like crazy. But that's what I mean by kind of meaning. I find meaning in those bugs even though I'm trying to make this video. And I think that that was kind of the whole point. Because as you've noticed, there's been some sounds. Um, there's been some distractions. But I think that that's exactly what makes this fun. And, and really challenges our notions of the meaning of life and the littlest places where we can find meaning. But anyway, the point is I don't think that we can find meaning in postmodern consumerism. I don't think we can find meaning in just material, in materiality and in material things. I don't think objects, while they can cause pleasure to some degree, I don't think that they ultimately give our lives the most meaning or at least maximize our meaning. So the final thing that I want to talk about, I've got about three minutes, is my own problem of finding depth, truth, and meaning in my own life. And so a lot of people tend to just want safety. So they don't want to ask a broad range of questions. They just want to ask a couple questions. And then once those questions are answered because, answered because they're relatively simple, then they're okay. I, however, I want to, I want to explore. And the point that I want to get out of, out, of, out of this is that this essentially, this attitude gives, gives my life a lot of, gives me a lot of feelings of disenchantment with society. So I'm very, I'm very critical of our kind of, uh, our violent culture and our, uh, our culture that has this lack of disregard and our, our desire to always look at people as statistics, as just numbers in this large system, and our, ability, our um, obsessive need to categorize people and to not see them as individuals or special and unique in their own uniqueness and subjectivity. And I think all of that's a problem. And so um, real fast, I want to say that I think that meaning is something that must be worked at. And so, of course, I'm only offering one way of going about things because essentially some people are completely content with finding meaning uh, in just, you know, just a few check marks. And they're, they're not, they're not, they don't really want to probe or explore. And it may be a conservative way of going about things, but they're happy with that. And maybe they can find meaning. I'm not going to judge and say that they don't. But for me personally, I'm basically offering an alternative to that kind of viewpoint. And my alternative is to stay curious, to keep exploring and to test the boundaries and to not be conservative, to ask as many questions as you can and try to get them answered and not settle for less and not settle at all. You know, so if we go back to Nietzsche and think of his idea of self-creation, then we realize that when we're, as artists, we're constantly creating. And so we're constantly creating our lives. And so it's something that we have to work at. And even though this is a hard lifestyle to adopt, it's a very hard lifestyle to adopt. In all honesty, it's a lot of what leads to my feelings of disenchantment and even sometimes I even collapse into a state of nihilism because I think I can't find my meaning in this world because there is no meaning in this world because this world has already decided what my meaning is. And what I'm saying is you need to avoid those kind of ideas. You need to avoid those ideas because they're very limiting. And um, I'm essentially saying that we need to create our meaning and we need to create the meaning that we have. So even though that clock is going off and it's really annoying right now, it's giving my life meaning. And even though it completely derailed my train of thought, I think that's exactly the fun of it. And I'm finding meaning by doing this spontaneous video, by challenging things, by challenging my mind, by challenging my potential. And I think that that's where all of the meaning is. Or can it, well, I wouldn't say that's where it all is, but I would say that that's where meaning can definitely be found. So just something to keep in mind, I'm definitely not saying leave your comfortable abode, but I'm also saying just consider the possibilities that are out there, and I think you'd be surprised the meaning that exists. This is Phoenix, and thank you.